then started attending watch night services. But okay. 31st December has never been a pleasant day for me because <laughs> of all the scrubbing and dusting and whatever. Yeah. Mm. Is this something you expose your own children to? Oh, yes. Mm. But um, as time has gone by, I'm sure they found their own style. Right. Mm. Well, thank you for this. Uh, because reading this it's like knowing you, mm. knowing the historical context within which you grew mm. up, your life story, and there's even a connection with your personality. So thank you so much for In this. broad <laughs> strokes. <laughs> I've said that every young girl should read this. Every oh. adult woman should read this. It makes a lot of difference. My daughter thought so. That's why I <laughs> allowed it to happen. Yeah. My daughter Nanekoya said, you must. And I said, I don't want to be... <laughs> But she said it will inspire other people. And, I, and uh, I'm, I'm a, a sucker for that one. Right. So once she made those arguments, I said, if it will help somebody, why not? There are things that uh, you know, people would hear and be very mm. surprised. The mm. fact that you sing, mm. the, f the fact that you, you are into poetry mm. and you actually recited a few on GBC radio. Yes. You got your first paycheck yes. from that. Yes. Tell us how you were exposed to that. As I, uh, you must know, my father was at GBC and uh, there was this children's program hosted by Mrs. Hannah Dankwa Smith. God rest her soul. She passed on earlier this year. And so he told her about me and uh, she wanted to meet me and uh, so she, she put me on the program. I, I went more than once. There's one of the pictures there is of me as a 10 year old. It, it was a picture from the radio and TV times. Right. That's an uncle of mine who must have a sense of history. He'll be pleased to hear me say that kept the pictures. So, ten, less than 10 years ago, he told me, do you know I have your picture from when you were in primary school and you went to GBC to recite? I said, you do? And she, he said, yes, I made a cutting. And he sent it to me. <laughs> and uh, so I scanned, photocopied, whatever. So now I have lots of copies of that one. And one of those is framed on the wall. Incredible. Mm. But I know the singing must have come from Elizabeth, your mom. Yes. And my dad too, actually. Okay. Wherever he went as a teacher, they, they were classmates. I'm sure you got that from me. Yes. So wherever he went as a teacher, he was a, a, a choir master in the Methodist church. If, if they had no choir, he started one. So... Um, they're singing in the family, yes. Mm. And it's, even when you went to Yale, you joined mm -hmm. the choir? Yes. That I was the only way I could stay sane. <laughs> <laughs> but now you're no longer in the choir, but you're a patron. When I'm in Ghana, I don't find the time, unfortunately. Right. But um, I used to sing in the singing band because there you didn't need to attend um, rehearsals. Mm. So I joined the singing band in my church for a number of years, but uh, now they have enough members not to need part-timers <laughs> like me, so I no longer uh, sing with them. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, another thing that's close to you that's and indeed husband. the family mm. is the NSMQ. Yes. It's a, this contest is for the nation, really, mm. but you were once a director. It's interesting, though, that your school, um, Wesley Girls, mm. has never won it. Is no. this something that, that you worry about? It's a matter of practice and preparation. And I think the, the girls' schools have other challenges. You know, the kind of... Uh, when I hear the kind of preparation and practice the boys' schools put their uh, contestants through, then I know it will be a, a challenge for the young women because mm. parents tend to want their daughters to come home during vacation. Right. Most of the contestants stay on in school mm. and uh, parents don't like that with their daughters. Right. So I think it's a matter of practice and uh, preparation and strategy. 
and uh, the, the young ladies are every bit as uh, intelligent and capable as the, but with everything you need practice mm. and they just don't have the time. Right. Mm. Is this something that you wish you could change? I don't know about wishing to change. You can wish on a star. <laughs> I mean, parents do. I remember growing up, you know, my, the first thing my parents would do when they went out and came home was to ask, where's Rita? So, I mean, I don't think they would have agreed that you should just stay on in school preparing for a contest two years ahead, as the boys do, mm. you know. So... Um, I wish things were different, yeah. but the, the, the world will not stop being round because you'd rather have a square world, you know. Right. So you, you take what you have and you go with it. Maybe someday it will happen. Maybe someday it will happen, yes. <laughs> but you, you pronounced your name. You just mentioned Rita. Mm. Henrietta. Mm. I'm learning the right pronunciation. Mm. But it's fascinating, from reading the book, I discovered where that name came from. Mm -hmm. Because your parents got it from a play. Mm -hmm. How did you get to learn about it and have you watched the play? Well, my parents were classmates at Wesley College. And they staged this uh, play, The Barretts of Wimpole Street. Incidentally, in Form 1 or Form 2, it was a literature book. Okay. Yes, and so... Mine isn't the only name from Barrett of Wimpole Street. My eldest brother, Octavius, or Oki. Oh. Oki comes from, and uh, Richard, Dr. Bamfo. His Richard also comes from the Barrett of Wimpole Street. <laughs> there were many of them. But the most famous, incidentally, is Elizabeth Barrett, who eloped with the poet Robert Browning. Right. So she's Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Uh -huh. And she's a famous English poet. Mm. What, is it, what is it with the play that all the children have something to do with it? They were classmates. <laughs> they did a play together in school. They loved it. They decided that they'd like to see those days. In our era, giving English names was the thing. Mm. So I suppose... Uh, in my father's family, every biblical name you can think of is there. So maybe he wanted to move away from uh, having to call me Mary or, or, or <laughs> Anna or something. And, and right. Yeah. So, uh, but, but it comes from their uh, school day and the, and the play they acted in together. So, mm. Mm. One of the things the book also highlighted... Uh, you got a C in P. Mm. Uh, that would soon change, by the way, mm. uh, because of your parents. Mm. But just wondering, C in P, mm -hmm. turn things around, soon became a champion in, in mm. athletics in your school. Mm. Uh, and then you got an, a first class in LLB at Lagos. Mm. I mean, you, you had, even with all these achievements, you are still doing the housework. Mm. How did you manage that kind of balance, even as a young person? My mother was particular about keeping your surroundings clean and running a home. And, you know, so I grew up in a home. And uh, so some of the things were part of what you learned uh, growing up in, in a home. Now, this C that I got in PE, what it did was to tilt, you see, when your report came in, my father would take it and uh, the couple would discuss. Between the two of them, you could never set one against the other. <laughs> they were always on the same page on everything. So they must have discussed what to tell me. And uh, so my father took the report, counted how many A's and B's I had versus how many C's. And my mother said, you are not an average student, but this report is telling us you are an average student, and we cannot accept that. And my father said, you even made a C in P. And I said, you see, but for that C, 
the balance would not have tilted. <laughs> and they were not impressed. Mm. And so they went through the report with me. And my father discovered that I had joined a lot of societies because in Wesley Girls, Forms 1 to 3, you couldn't join any society. But in Form 4, you could join any society. And I had joined so many that according to him, I attended a society meeting every day and even Sundays and extras. And I said, no, that's not how it works. He says, well, that's what... That's the story the report mm. tells us. And so you have to choose. You can choose any two, but you shouldn't have to commit to more than two societies and society meetings every week. It means you are not spending enough time studying. Mm. And that's what I did. So that is the story of the PE. Mm -hmm. uh, I was always... Uh, as much of a sportswoman as I could manage. I represented Wesley Girls at uh, uh, Intercor throwing shot, the shot pot. Yeah, you weren't expecting that. Shot pot was my <laughs> event, and now I have a, a sore shoulder for it. <laughs> oh. And then I played hockey. You were captain of the hockey team. Which my father also played in school. Right. The, the initial Ghana hockey uh, Mm -hmm. He was on it with Mr. Kenamwa, right. the late Mr. Kenamwa of GDC. Right. Yes. So my father was very sporty in that way. My mother, no. You know, I'm asking this because a lot of uh, the young ones, mm. well, we're all guilty of it. We're on mm. social media a lot. Mm. Uh, but you did a bit of everything mm. and still you were excellent. Mm. How do you balance it today with social media? In our day, there was no social media. So, so um, maybe we are talking of different eras. And, right. uh, but uh, I was interested in those things. And uh, when I wasn't interested, I didn't do, uh, put in much effort. So I suppose my interest had something to do with it. And my mother was always uh, insistent that uh, she was bringing up an African woman mm. and I had to be an African woman. So right. uh, housework, uh, cleaning, scrubbing, my goodness, and all of that was part of my, my, my upbringing. Mm. So um, I, I can't claim any credit really right. for getting things just right. I, w I, I was just lucky. Mm. Well. I keep saying that for me, I don't call it luck. I call it the grace of God. And I've enjoyed plenty of it. Mm. God has been there for me at every point when something could have gone wrong. So I, I feel a bit of a fake claiming credit for something over which I had no control. Somebody was out there looking out for me, that's all. Mm, right. Um, let's talk about your first national assignments mm. um, outside uh, this country, mm. even though you came back to also be on the National Reconciliation Commission as a member. Let me tell you that my first national assignment was not what you think, but as a member of the Legal Committee of the National Commission on Children, Right. I represented Ghana on the Intergovernmental Committee of Experts on oh. the uh, Declaration of Welfare, uh, Rights and Welfare of the African Child. Right. So that was uh, when I stood out as a Ghanaian right. to represent the interests of Ghana and the Ghanaian child. Mm. And that committee, that legal committee did a lot. We initiated the conversations on child abuse and child labor and all of those things in the early 90s and interacted with the new district assemblies to draw their attention to the plight of children in their district assemblies. And don't, don't, I'm sure it's no surprise to you that Ghana was the first to ratify mm. the, the rights 
of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. We had a lot to do with that. Right, yes. right. Well, so that was the first assignment, really, on oh. behalf of the children of Ghana. Yes. Right. Well, thanks to you, we've come a long way. But you also went on to be on the National Reconciliation Commission. Committee. In fact, you were the youngest member yes. then to be on the commission. Uh, they nicknamed me Baby Commissioner. <laughs> <laughs> um, how, how did you... How did you do it, really? You were a professor at the age of 45. You were on all these in important commissions and committees. How do you think that happened for you? What happened was um, when I was tapped for it, I was a little nervous. Incidentally, the president now was the attorney general who called me to a sudden meeting. And I had just come home from uh, representing Ghana on the Lockerbie, uh, the, o the OAU committee mm. on Lockerbie. So I thought that was what um, the Attorney General wanted to report to Cabinet about, because he said he needed to see me. He was going to Cabinet. So I thought he was going to report on Ghana's position on Lockerbie. So I took all the extra reports, thinking that maybe what I submitted through the ministry hadn't reached him. And I got there and he said, the president says to tell you that uh, you should serve on this committee. I said, no, I'm too young. And he said, well, President Kufu, I think the young people of Ghana also need to be represented. Because <laughs> I thought it was for uh, very senior people. So that's how I got on. And that told me that uh, the nature of it was going to be difficult to combine with anything, so I took a sabbatical. Oh, uh, yeah. I was due for a sabbatical anyway, but had not planned to, to take it. But when that happened, then I applied formally to take a sabbatical. So mm -hmm. I was on sabbatical leave for the period. Right. But I had to teach because we were short-staffed. So I, I did extra teaching uh, just to keep things going at the faculty, but I was on sabbatical leave officially. Right. One of the important committees, I guess, would be the education review, mm. uh, of which you are a member of. Mm. And I can't help but ask, uh, because of the work that you did, mm. the quality of education today, particularly mm. in the tertiary mm. um, education level, is that what the plan was? Is that what you envisaged? This is the Anamoa Committee, Anamoa Mensa mm -hmm. Committee. Mm. And um, you see, some things steal upon you if you don't take care. So suddenly there was an explosion, and everybody wanted tertiary education, which is good because in the past, uh, the international organizations we dealt with thought that people should have primary education. And I remember um, personalities like. Uh, Dr. Okonjo Iwiala saying that she had got to where she had got to, not because of primary education, but because of tertiary education. Mm. So the need to switch around our focus so that people could have tertiary education uh, became preeminent. The problem with the educational system is that it's a social good. So some things can steal up on you. We used to have um, what they called, I forget what the name is now, it was the Ministry of Finance, but it was like they tried to match our, our human resource needs. Those days they called mm -hmm. it manpower something something. But uh, I think at, at some point we abandoned it. Unfortunately, I think although we had adopted, I was a member of committees on campus, we had adopted uh, 40, 60 percent in favor of science because we were producing too many arts graduates. But when there was an explosion in the tertiary sector, I think too many of the private institutions went in the direction of uh, the general arts uh, system, which is not as expensive as mm. science. And so uh, I believe that's been part of the difficulties we've had, that we have so many uh, 
people with qualifications in the arts and there's a death of science-based um, disciplines. Right. But I think we'll, we'll get it right at, uh, uh, as we go on. Mm. So you wanted to know what I think of it? I think every generation produces what it is capable of producing. Our students are still doing very well when they go abroad to other universities in the same way as in my generation. Mm. So who am I to say that their quality is lower? Right. It may be different, but it may be dictated by the needs of the time. Mm. Now they, they have all these social media outlets to help. They have all these computers. In our day, we literally slept in the law library. In their day, they have most of the materials they need on their laptops. Mm. The difference is that we went to the library to read because there was no other option. They think they have the material on their laptops, so they know it. And I have been constantly cajoling them that having it in your room is not equivalent to having it in your head. Mm. So I think making the jump between having it ready on hand and reading it has been a challenge for some. Right. Yeah. Are you surprised that we have all these numbers wanting to read law? No, not surprised. You see, all these uh, bright young people, mostly young men, appearing on TV and throwing around theories. Uh, it's bound to uh, make law look fascinating. It has always been, I must say. But now, it's even more fascinating. Mm. In our parents' generation, and I suppose in mine, many people read law while working so that when they retired from the public service, they could have careers in law. But I think the young people now... Their aims may be different, mm. but I suspect that seeing all these jazzy uh, looking young people throwing around big words and yeah. big ideas <laughs> and so on has to have some attraction mm. uh, for, for, for young people. So maybe that's the reason. How was it in, in, in your, well, maybe your, your time and um, years after because... Mm. Uh, recently, when over 800 students were called to the bar, mm. young lawyers were called to the bar, uh, it made a, a huge buzz. People mm. were posting lawyers and people were looking for lawyers who had graduated to post. Mm -hmm. How were you celebrating it in your days? In our day, Call to the bar. Life <laughs> was very different. I think my, in my class, we may have been maybe a little over 60 mm. called to the bar. We had had a disturbed year going to carry cocoa and all of that. I'm not complaining because <laughs> I was able to have my second child in peace. <laughs> so we were called to the bar in December. Mm. And... Uh, and in those days, the call was held in the Chief Justice's court, which is a much smaller court than the, what the Supreme Court. I think it was remodeled and expanded and so on. But in those days, the call was in the court, in the courtroom. And uh, it was a small event. You took it, you celebrated. Uh, I remember cooking for a few... Uh, people I loved to cook mm -hmm. these days I don't cook anymore but cooking was my hobby really and I took cookery for all levels so uh, I remember having a, a little dinner party for my friends and family who had come but those days it wasn't a big deal <laughs> those days it wasn't a big deal right social media has made a lot of difference to, to these mm. things, these images and so on. In our day, I, I don't recall that there was anything like mm. that.
going back to the commissions that you served on, mm. the National Reconciliation mm. Commission, one of the memorable mm. uh, commissions, but do you think that the lessons have been learned? Unfortunately not. The very fact that there was all this talk not too long ago about unconstitutional changes of power and the attraction to some young people and uh, all of that. Let's have a coup. It was like, let's go on a picnic. Mm. Mm. They have no idea. I blame the authorities in some way because the report of the National Reconciliation Commission was put online. But those days, how many people had access to online material anyway? And the philosopher George Santayana has said so, that if you forget the past, you are condemned to repeat it. Mm. And many of the things happening, people suddenly jacking up their prizes because of this exchange control and causing a lot of misery and all of them. All of these are 1983 reenacted, really. Ghanaians don't know enough about their history. And young people in Ghana don't know enough about their history. We've tried everything. So when I, I, I was very alarmed at the, even the kind of people encouraging unconstitutional uh, changes of power. We've been there. We've been there. And we know that nobody has a, a magic wand. And we know also that the press keeps quiet during unconstitutional changes because it is so dangerous to be in the press. You will be whisked to prison before you know it. And so there's always a silence at the time when very terrible things are happening. And so people take that for the fact that those things didn't happen. Mm. And the National Con Reconciliation Commission report talks about all of those things. But who's reading it? So the number of people who have come to me since then and said, we are doing a PhD and we need help, National Reconciliation Commission report. I said, but it was online. They said, well, I went there and it's no longer there. Then I, I, I share what I downloaded for me, which somebody else shared with me because I couldn't find uh, the uh, copies later and so on. So we are making a dreadful mistake. We are making a dreadful mistake keeping our history from our children. It is not for nothing that in the Bible they are, the Israelites are told, teach it to your children and to your children's children. Wear it around your neck. Put it on your foot. Because human mind is so short-framed. Let me put it that way. And sometimes the things one generation knows to the other generation is complete news. Imagine my surprise when I met a young graduate of the University of Ghana who had graduated in political science and had never heard of the National Reconciliation Commission. I was shocked. But when I recovered from my shock, I said, but it's not her fault. Mm. It's not her fault. We are not learning from our history. It may be embarrassing, but we will repeat it unless we know the pitfalls and what happened, hmm. and the human rights abuses, and the fact that the kind of things people say, walk around, do, they couldn't have done without the protection of a constitution. As somebody once told me, even a bad constitution is better than nothing. You can run to the courts. When there the, the is an unconstitutional change of government where are you going to go and anybody can do anything to you and get away with it the number of Ghanaians who denounced others and who got into trouble because somebody had gone and reported that they had done something and nobody investigated and they were arrested mm. you'd be amazed 
But as they say, you never know what you have until you have lost it. Right. So our young people don't know what they have. Mm. In the book, you talk about people approaching you at social events, mm -hmm. people who didn't appear no. formally before the commission Not and at telling all. their stories. Not at all. Sometimes you were at a party and they wouldn't even let you eat. I said, why don't you file a petition? Eh, they will think. But telling me about it at a party and stopping me from having my fun at my party will not change anything for you. Some people did not want any compensation, but they were afraid that it would give the impression they wanted compensation. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, we need to hear these stories. We need to catalog these stories. One of the biggest weapons of the human rights movement is documentation. Because when you document it, it's available. And because it is documented, there's less of a risk of it happening again right. without anybody catching the signs. Mm. But uh, they will tell you all the sub stories. I will listen, of course. But the imagery I always used, and I still use for some things, is that a football match is played in regulation time on a certain pitch according to certain rules. If you don't go by it, never mind what a wonderful scorer you are. I'm sure there are many people who can score goals better than Messi sitting on their own uh, little pitches in their own places. But they don't get to be in the World Cup. Mm. And I'm sure the goals that the people who took the missed penalties failed to score. There were a few Ghanaians in their own living rooms scoring those goals. But they were not part of the match. Mm. So when a system is set up to do these things in a, uh, it will always be untidy because the society sees itself in a mirror and the society doesn't like what it sees. So it's either in denial or angrily rejecting it as this is not us and so on. But look what happened when the CD and dollar uh, demonstration started happening. A drug I used to buy for about 56 CDs. Somebody looked me in the face and said it was 450 CDs. I still intend to go and see that young man. You know. So we did all those things because there was a shortage. And look what happened. We even executed heads of state. We are suppressing all that information because it's embarrassing. But the result of it is that the next generation and the one after it will do it again mm. because they don't know. They haven't lived in a situation where anybody can look, give you a certain look and then you know you are in trouble. Mm. So how, how Do you know that there's a woman in this country whose two sons in the military were executed and she was prohibited from having a funeral? Do you know? I didn't know that. We've done all those things. All the things you read in books about other people during conflict, we've done them here. There was an account of a woman who was about eight months pregnant. Mm. Who was beating yes messlessly yes so she gave birth to a child we heard blind. that petition in kumasi yes every there was not a dry eye in the room there wasn't a dry eye in the room because she was beating on the stomach and all she wanted was some assistance so the boy could get a, a job because he, he had learned uh, to weave something, he had had some, uh, he had learned a trade, but nobody was giving him a chance, and mm -hmm. she that was what she wanted, you know, so that he could earn a living from the skill. Mm -hmm. and so there wasn't a dry eye in the room. We've done all those things before, but I'm afraid we are losing the lessons. So how do young people express their frustrations? There are those who are calling for a new constitution. There are those who. For instance, you talk about the 
the price uh, situation people were calling for the presidency to control prices for instance how do we express our frustration if you know a path that somebody trod and the result they got when you are considering alternatives you might not consider it but if you think it is an answer we thought so once that people who had bought some things to sell at a certain price would automatically uh, reduce it and sell it to us and make a loss. That doesn't happen in commerce. You see, what happened with the controlled price system was that people then had to take chits to go and get allocations. Did they use the allocations for themselves? No. They turned around and sold that 10 times the price. And it's human behavior. We should never think that Ghanaians are different from other people. We are not. So we will respond the same way that other people respond in scarcity. Mm. The, the people who can fashion alternatives, surely, must know where we've been before, what we've tried before and see what is possible right. Uh -huh. right but if you you sit in your home and determine that somebody ought to be forced to sell the thing at a certain price you are going to have to do it so forcibly aren't you mm -hmm. you are going to have to seize the goods and sell and whip people and uh, get long queues when you have only 10 things to sell and get people who themselves are trading on the black market to then enforce these cues. Mm. We've been there. We've been there, my goodness. If there's hell on earth, we've been there. Mm. Let me tell you a story if you have time. I was in the law school, I had two babies. I was going to take Trotro from the area in front of uh, um, UTC because we lived at North Kanishi. And then I came across this long queue at GB Olivant. Those days, you didn't even ask, what are they selling? The moment you saw a long queue, you joined. So I joined. Two hours of sweat in the sun. Two places before mine, we were told the goods had run out. They were selling peak milk, the container that we find on the shelf these days. They closed the gate, came back and told us, well, the peak milk is finished, but they have iron bestets, if you are interested. Who, who, who buys iron bestets in place of milk? <laughs> Two hours wasted. And all this time, the soldiers were there controlling the queues with whips mm. and so on. We've been there. Let's not go there. Let's talk about Ayawaso, mm. West Wagon. That mm. commission you also sat on. Mm. Are you satisfied with the level of implementation of the team's work and effort? Some of the recommendations were bound to be implemented off the public eye. Mm. So I don't know what was implemented away from the public eye. Right. I can't say I'm satisfied. But I have more pain with the lack of implementation of the National Reconciliation Commission report. Because if we had done that, perhaps IAWAS would not have happened. Mm. We should also understand when we are in power that you do not weaponize national security because you will not always be in power. You see, you will not always be in power. So when you start a new unit and you leave power, and another group takes over, they may use it in a way that you did not intend. All of these are part of the lessons of nation building. And I'm, I'm certain that those who ought to have learned something have learned. Mm. But not everything can be, can be done in the public eye. So I hope that those recommendations that required some reform and so on of the security system 
has been done. Right. Is it too late? Because you talk so passionately about the National Reconciliation Commission's mm. report. Is it too late to begin to expose uh, some of the findings? No. Because we, it spanned a long period of time from our independence. So there are many lessons that can be drawn. There was, for example, the Preventive Detention Act. Mm -hmm. It may have been, the National Assembly passed it. It may have been necessary at the time. How was it implemented? By people who had personal scores, because there were no real rules. Mm. So for us as a nation, we must learn that when you give power to people without controls, you, you, you will have grief. There were people who wound up in, in detention only because they were chasing the same girl as, as a powerful person. There was one terrible case from, I think it was in Eastern Region that we had that petition, where this person who was walking in front of a police station was arrested. Now, he didn't hail from there. He had gone to visit a co-tenant um, in some other part of the country who had moved back home. So when the co-tenant heard that his guest had been arrested, he went, followed up to the police station to find out what the guy had done. He too was arrested. Both of them went on to detention for a number of years. I mean, when you give human beings power without control, there's no end to the uses people will make of those powers. So we should learn those lessons and not just tell people do this and expect everybody to be sensible expect everybody to be reasonable expect everybody to be law abiding it just doesn't work that way human beings respond to rules we must learn those lessons if we don't we will have grief mm. because when something happens and you design a response sometimes you are so anxious to get a result that it doesn't occur to you to moderate the downsides. But if you know that human nature tends to, to do this, that's why Lord Acton's saying is so true, that power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. You see? Then you will always make sure when you make the rules, there are the checks. Mm. People must report back. People must uh, have a, a definite reason for doing it. That reason must be subject to judicial control. All of those things mm. are intended to be a check on the exercise of that power. Right. But if you don't check it, my goodness, you are in, you are mm. in trouble. Mm. That's one of the problems with what they call mob justice, which I just I call mob violence in pursuit of uh, ad, uh, uh, ad, uh, what agendas related to, mm. to, to uh, seeking justice. You see, you can steal a handkerchief and be lynched. You can steal 10 cities and mm -hmm. be lynched. You can steal 10,000 and be lynched. Mm. You can steal a mobile phone and be lynched. And yet, in the criminal justice system, we have arranged different penalties for different kinds of things. Right. When the mob enforces their notion of justice, it's one sentence for everything. Mm -hmm. mm. mm. Well, you served on um, all these commissions. You served in the UN as well. Mm -hmm. You took up international assignments. Mm -hmm. Uh, but here you are today, mm -hmm. you've come back home, Yes. you're no longer in the classroom. No. Um, you are the Supreme Court. Yes. How is life there? You want official truth or <laughs> real truth? <laughs> real truth. <laughs> it's challenging. 
as a law teacher, and I've written so much, mm -hmm. you, you give an overview, you study a situation and go into some detail uh, in, uh, with a bird's eye view kind of situation, matching it against theory. Mm -hmm. You get into the reality of things. Let me go back to my time in the UN. I was in charge of uh, the rule of law sector in the UN in, in, in Liberia. Okay. And it became clear to me when we began to have major constitutional challenges that there was this agreement, the peace agreement, suspended the Liberian constitution for a period of time until a democratically elected government would come into being and then the constitution would come back. Mm. That was the arrangement. What was not foreseen was that all nature abhors a vacuum. So all the arrangements made to first solidify the peace and to nurture it were all arrangements that had changed the underpinnings of the constitution. So when you bring back the constitution, the constitution that did not successfully negotiate and mediate the differences, and you bring it back without all the arrangements you made in the interim mm. to protect the peace and to nurture it, you have a problem. Because mm. the world would have changed some understandings would have changed right. and so on. And so when you are in the courtroom and you are building justice block by block and there are human faces, when the case is called, the parties uh, stand up and you take their details and so on. It's a slightly different mm -hmm. task from right. when you are writing about those things and applying the theory and so it is useful if you have the theory so that you can match it against the practice right but if you don't have the theory then you have a problem mm. of building block by block but without any pattern okay right and and that can be a problem also mm. so i think that uh, all the work I've done with theory, and I used to teach jurisprudence for mm -hmm. many years. So all the work I've done with legal theory come up again and again mm. against practical reality. And then you have to use the tools you have acquired right. to adjust mm. um, the, 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 the rights and arrangements and so on. Right. So it is challenging, yes. When you meet your students, I mean, you've taught many, 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 many lawyers, uh, and they appear before you. Mm -hmm. How is the relationship like when you're sitting on the other side and they're in front of you? They, we trained them to practice right. law. So if they are practicing law, that's what we trained them for. <laughs> right. Are you tempted to be a teacher on the bench? No. Okay. No, because there are two sides in every dispute. Mm. So you have to be careful how you interface with one side so that the other side does not feel threatened. Right. Right. That okay. doesn't mean that now and again some suggestions don't surprise me. Mm. But... It's all in the course of uh, uh, human beings dealing with emergent issues. Right. So uh, it's all in a day's work. Let me put it that okay. way. Okay. Mm. All right. Well, finally, I would like to take advice uh, for young girls mm. and obviously mm. lawyers, mm. young lawyers. What mm. would you say? Focus on what you are doing. Mm. Give it your best. After all, in all the promises we make, the one promise we can keep is that we'll do our best. 
You will not always be right, but it's important that you do your best. Mm. And whatever your hands find to do, do it to the best of your ability. And I'm sure that uh, uh, in time, the benefits will show. I can't tell you that I set out to achieve this and do this and do that. And just on a case-by-case -case basis, do your best. Right. Don't be sidetracked by too many things. I tell my students who work, when they first take on the law, I said, the law is jealous. It will not share you with too many things. So be careful the number of things you take on. Some people want to be lawyers and want to be pastors. And how, how can you do both well? You can't mix God and mammon. You can't do both well. Because each one requires you to go the extra mile. Mm -hmm. So be careful the things you take on. When you decide to study law, unfortunately, some friendships have to go. Some social commitments have to go. You have to make choices, and you keep making the choices all the time. Right. The law is jealous and will not share you with too many things. Mm. Yeah. Well, thank you very much uh, for this conversation. Thank you for certainly for this book. Uh, but coffee, was it your choice? <laughs> coffee, I probably. Yes, ma'am. I like his writing. I like his language. And he happened to be my daughter's classmate okay. at the School of Communication Studies. Right. So when I was uh, uh, arguing with her about why I shouldn't have the book, then she said, you don't even need to do it yourself. You can get somebody to do it for you. And I said, well, who do you think? And she said, Kofi Akpabli. And I said, OK, I like the way he writes. <laughs> you know, so it was a compromise, because I didn't think anybody <laughs> would find my life interesting, frankly. No, this is awesome. I have read it once. I will read it again. And oh. I want to pass it on. So now I want to get it as a gift and give it to other young women. Oh. Every woman must read this. Oh. This is everything. Oh, really? You, you, you've made it all worthwhile. <laughs> I've been nervous about it. I said, why open your life up to you? But I, my daughter said, we will learn something. My yeah. generation needs to yeah. learn something. Yes. So really, you have Nanekuya to thank for this. Yeah. I'm actually jealous of your daughters. Oh, you are? Yes, I am. No, you have no <laughs> need. You have no need. I have so many sons and daughters. You are welcome to be one. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mom. Thank you.